be happy to invite Dr. Vinny Gopal Rao. He has been working in the industry for 21 years and he is currently working at Dr. Reddy's as a lead structural characterization person. He is MBA from NMIMS Institute in Navi Mumbai. Dr. Gopal. Stage is yours. And uh, it's a very detailed presentation from Pradeep Ayer and Ashtosh, Dr. Ashtosh, on the aggregation and uh, uh, the higher order structure and secondary structures by uh, Pradeep using CD and some of the light scattering techniques, uh, including the size exclusion. Not Um, so this is the building where we work. Uh, so I think some of you know. So uh, I am on the peptides background, not on the large molecules which we call it as maths or biosimilars. So I believe the content which I am going to speak would be applicable even for the biosimilars using the AAC as a context and principles. So I'll be. Uh, Thanks, Pradeep, for very detailed discussion on you know so various techniques and various uh, detailed experiment experimentation details on uh, some of the aggregation studies. And I will be touching on basically uh, you know uh, AUC and basic principle and some of the use cases where it is applicable. We have used for small molecules like peptides and you know some of the, the protein-related products. Would, I believe it would be helpful for even large molecules. And uh, we all know that uh, the proteins are different from peptides in terms of its size and the length. And basically, it is between the smaller and large molecules. And one of the most important aspects which we are talking about is aggregation profile, which basically causes immunogenicity, which uh, Dr. Ashutosh analyzed a lot. And basically, this is, uh, you know, so immunogenicity causes uh, because of antimers. <laughs> It could be because of the process changes, some of the products you can see where, uh, the, where the originated products are from RDNA technology where some of the most <coughs> synthesized products which are coming into the market like the GLP-1 receptors, the process can lead to agglomerations and uh, as Dr. Pradeep I mentioned. So some of the pre star studies, the stress conditions during the transportation and also like uh, uh, packing components, the container closures and then leachables from the your process components which are used in the, during the manufacturing process. A small quantities of this can trigger the, the, the aggregation which can lead to immunogenicity. Of course, the immunogenicity intensity in terms of uh, for proteins is higher when compared with the peptides, but so it is important to understand for peptides and the comparability assessment needs to be done to seek the regulatory approval. So, uh, so these are the some of the molecules from a value perspective or sales perspective. Uh, you know, so these well competes with the large molecules or mass in terms of its sales volume. Uh, some of the GLP-1 receptors where you know it's generating multi-billion uh, in terms of revenue. So that is where many companies are working on this, and it's having a lot of uh, potential to go even further growth. And of course, this is a slide which uh, Dr. Pradeep has uh, spoken it about on various techniques to use for the characterization uh, for the primary, secondary, tertiary, and hierarchical structures. And I will be focusing on the last one where uh, the SV SVAUC, which is used for to understand the protein aggregates. And of course, this is an orthogonal to SEC mass as well as a few other techniques. Probably in the, in the next slide, it will come. So as we are emphasizing on what is this need, if we go back like you know 15 20 years before agencies, regulatory agencies were not emphasizing much on this. And over the period, the regulatory agencies are learning along with the industry. So that is why this is one of the talk uh, slide deck from the FDA speaker, uh, FDA reviewer, where they say uh, the evidence should be provided to ensure the So 
this is where it receives uh, the higher on the structure aggr or aggregation profile uh, need to be comparable to that of RLD product and its levels to be less than that of RLD if you wanted to see. Or else we may have to study its impact on the bioassays, biological activity, uh, which would again lead to which will lead to time consuming and expensive. And basically, you know, so there are multiple techniques for each of the study parameters to understand where you know orthogonal angular techniques is important because every technique, as Pradeep explained, it was the principle is different. That is why it is important to understand from an you know, dimensional perspective. <coughs> so, and few more important aspects is its levels to be similar to that of RLD or less than to that of RLD, and aggregation comparable to studies should include the stress conditions as well. So this is what ADC also emphasizes a lot and these are the techniques which I am going to speak it about. And, and one of the beauty of this technique where CD and SCC models, it undergoes slightly the sample modification. Where the beauty of the SCC can be studied in native state as very much similar to that of uh, NMR. Where there is no sample preparation requirement, it can be measured on its native state, that is where we can see the real time data. And agency also expects the near release as well as the end, end of the shelf life sample to seek the final approval of the product. And the usage of multiple orthogonal methods, validated methods, when I say again validated, each method to be ensured for its fixed per purpose. So this is what is important from, uh, from a submission perspective. <coughs> and if you go back to the history of AUC, so AC is not something new, it's a very, very old uh, technique. And of course, its usage has come in the recent past very high, very significant. So that's where if you see uh, some of the old equipments from Beckman, uh, 1948, 1991, and this is the latest one where it is having both uh, uh, the multiple optic systems like UV, interference, and fluorescence. So where it can be used for all sorts of, all categories of the products. So as a principle, what it does when you apply uh, the basically it works on the first principle when when you apply centrifugal force, it starts settling to begin uh, you know the sedimenting the product. That is where using the mathematical equation and you know, also we try to understand sedimentation <coughs> coefficient and then further get the information about the drug substance or drug product. So what we wanted to measure. So this is the AC equipment present in our lab, uh, which is around the clock used uh, to study. And as uh, Pradeep mentioned many times, we used to see this as a postmortem and as a submission requirement. So nowadays, this has begun to start with you know, as a product development tool to understand. Some of the products where we see at the end, uh, when we do with uh, the stress studies, etc., at the end, product is with slightly different behavior compared to the RD. And again, we have to go to the drawing board and then see what else a process modification needs to be done to understand, to get it into all this similarity. So that's where you need to use these advanced characterization techniques <coughs> during the product development. So this is an orthogonal to the SEC malls, and as I mentioned, this is a column-free environment, and you know, so there is no shearing effect. So it, it is going to analyze the native state, and it comes with three of the uh, you know detection modes: observance, intensity, optics. And uh, which is basically used for all maps and other peptides, proteins, where in some of the cases like carbohydrates, polysaccharides, where it doesn't have UV absorbance. So generally we use interference optics. In one more uh, instance, where like some of these uh, peptides and lot molecules, uh, some of the stabilizers were used, like a phenol, metacrasol, and these uh, having a similar uh, UV max, same as that of the large molecule, that is where we will not be able to use it the UV and then we prefer the interference optics. And of course the fluorescence is the best one if you are able to differentiate and then give it use higher sensitivity. And in terms of machine capability basically it, it works in the range of 190 to 800 nanometers, molecular weight range of something like you know, close to very low molecular weight to 10 to the power of 6 Daltons that is the potential of this uh, uh, the machine. And this is also having a little bit concentration since uh, the limitation when compared with size exclusion chromatography, of course, it's having its own advantage in terms of the resolving power of higher molecular weight aggregates. And the interference 
optics is again, uh, you know, we can go the slightly more dynamic range of the machine. And it is used basically to see the aggregates and also to quantify the aggregates to what level it is and the homogeneity of the sample, whether it is, you know, so having um, uh, the monomer or multimers and the size distribution of the samples can be understood. And of course, to understand the antigen antibody, uh, you know, so the interactions and then receptor ligand. And of course, this is also used in some of the amorphous solid discussions to understand the real it is this. Uh, the amorphous solid dispersion is formed to stabilize some of the products. So, as a principle, what it does actually, so when the solute is present in the, uh, you know, when it is present in the gravitational field, so basically there are three forces act on it. When, when you start sedimenting with the gravitational force, the basically two of the opposite forces are like frictional force and then valence forces. The frictional forces are like molecules are moving in very random directions and then those will opposing to settle the, the molecule. Where using the lamb equation, so uh, basically uh, it, it try to evaluate between concentration of the, the distribution of variations of molecules in the centrifugal field as a function of time with two of the competing processes, which is basically called as diffusion and sedimentation term. I think, uh, you know, so these are already included in the softwares and there are ready made softwares <coughs> already, we don't need to sweat it to understand these equations. So this is how we see the you know so sedimentation velocity output. Uh, what we see when we start sedimenting the the molecule with a gravitational force, the, the sedimentation force, uh, centrifugal force. Basically, it oppose like frictional force and diffusional force, and then we'll see molecule will start settling down, uh, the more concentrating more from towards the bottom. And generally, what we see is the sedimentation coefficient. The sedimentation coefficient is basically. Uh, you know, uh, the molecule which is passing from one time point to the another time point with respect to the slope. What is the slope? Slope is nothing but the sedimentation coefficient. And from an SV AC, basically, unlike uh, SV, uh, the size extension chromatography coupled with multi angular layer scattering or UV, there are not much of consumables and not much of uh, sample operations, but of course. Uh, the cell preparation is very, very critical to get the right quality of the data from an AUC perspective. And there are multi the different types of cells. This is how the cell assembly looks like. Uh, this is the centerpiece where the sample would be placed into it. And there are uh, different types of centerpieces, the way the charcoal centerpiece, which can go up to 42,000 RPM. And uh, sorry for the typo error, this is an aluminum centerpiece, which can go up to 60,000 RPM. Where for typically large molecules, we don't need to spin it in this kind of higher speed. Being, we work with peptides of even you know, so few thousands of uh, daltons. We need to uh, spin it at very, very high RPM uh, to settle the molecule basically. That's where we need aluminum centerpiece and even for la large molecules, we don't need to run for longer times. And small molecules, we run up to like 24 hours, even 36 hours to see the, uh, the proper data. And uh, so there are different types of cell rotors. Basically, you know, we, we can use the four cell rotor, eight cell rotor to enhance the throughput. Uh, the limitation of the eight cell rotor is up to only 50,000 RPM we can go. And when we run the sample like in the four cell rotor, one would be the counterbalance and three would be samples where we can run three samples. Always it is important to ensure that the counterbalance versus the sample, the weight indifference should not be more than 0.5 grams. This is very, very critical. And the cell cleaning is also very important. If, if the cell quality is not good, then we are not going to get the right data. That is what is very, very important. The cell cleaning also is very important. So once we get the AUC data, there is a commercial software like a cell uh, to understand uh, the processing of the data. Once there are a few steps, I will just put it as a, uh, you know, the diagrammic uh, representation. So where uh, once you load the data and then this, this is how the raw data looks like. Uh, this is the plot and then uh, this is the bitmap what you see the quality of the data. And then once you do it, uh, we have to select the meniscus, uh, what is the solvent meniscus, sample meniscus and then you know so uh, from the bottom. Uh, and then we have to choose the selection of the model where to see the sedimentation coefficients. And then we have to choose some of the important parameters. Uh, to process the data, one is like a frictional ratio and then 
the density of the solvent, viscosity of the solvent, these are very, very important uh, to get the, the right outcome from an experiment. So once you do that, then you process it, you will end up with, you know, so the final data, where you click on each peak, you will end up with the right information, like what is the sedimentation <coughs> or uh, what is the molecular weight of the component and you know so also you will see the RSD where you will find the quality of the data. So now I will be presenting uh, two of the use cases where we use this. Uh, uh, so basically these are some of the GLP-1 receptors. In the formulation this doesn't exist as a monomer and it exists as a multimer where it is important to understand what is the molecular weight of multimer. And, and that is where, because of its multimer nature, it's a, uh, the prolonged half-life and compared with the other category of uh, these molecules. And this is where one of the, uh, the public domain information where uh, the one of the peptide, which is 32 amino acid peptide, it exists as a you know, heptamer in the solution form. And it is important to understand whether it is heptamer or any other form, uh, so this is the data presented by size exclusion chromatography. And of course there are uh, some limitations when it comes to size exclusion chromatography, it is important to choose the right pH and the right solvent composition. If someone choose unknowingly that if mobile based composition is having an organic solvent, then you end up with the monomer not having, uh, not going to end up with heptamer. So that is very importantly to, uh, you know, at what pH uh, the product forms this and you can see uh, at, at a product given pH, it exists as a purely heptamer and then if you keep on changing the pH, it converts into the, uh, the dodecamer or something else. This is very, very, very important to understand the product nature. So, EAC is uh, used for this to understand its, uh, uh, the nature of the product, what form it is present and this is basically runs at uh, 36 uh, hours and time being this is a small molecular weight uh, peptide. So it takes a large time to sediment and if you see the molecular weight of the, 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 the peptide which is about 26,000 which shows that it is a heptamer. The monomer molecular weight is about 300, 3000 uh, 3, Dalton, 3700 Dalton. So that is where it exists as a heptamer. And of course, uh, this represents like uh, the, the distribution and then the bitmap represents the quality of the data. So that is where orthogonality is very important, whatever we do it on this large molecules characterization. So as uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep mentioned, the stress study is also very, very important. So this is just to show an example that at the product pH, how, how the product behaves. So it exists as heptamer with a very precise molecular weight and its native form of close to 99.9% .9 with a sedimentation coefficient of 1.4. And when you start doing a stress study like a free star, it could be like, uh, thank you. So free star, uh, any other stress condition, then it starts showing, you know, higher molecular weight aggregates. This is where, again, it is very important to, like, to go back and then look at it, what is happening in the product uh, to address this. But, uh, very importantly, this is not going to be very acceptable to the regulatory agency. So similarly, we, uh, you know, so this comes uh, uh, basically from human serum albumin, which is a protein which is used in one of the product, uh, you know, nanoparticulate product, where it is used as a stabilizer and to uh, in the product, uh, basically, which is a hydrophobic drug, which is engulfed into the protein to work as a carrier. Uh, and few important aspects, the HSA undergoes uh, high pressure homogenization during the process of manufacturing. Then it's not changing its monomer to the dimer or oligomers. So it is very important to understand using multiple techniques, what is the monomer and then other aggregates contained. So, and this is the size exclusion chromatography coupled with light streaming data where uh, you see, you know, the monomer molecular weight of 66. Thousand Dalton and dimer, tri, you know, so tetramer, and then keep on going higher algomers. So at the end, we have to show that its levels to be very much similar to that of our idea, you know, less than that of our agency. So the AUC then it gives more or less similar information, but as 
you know, so we discuss. It works on its own principle. Sometimes you may see slightly seeing a different number. However, it should be comparable to the top reference product. That's what is most important. So when you look at the monomer, you will end up, with, you will see the similar molecular weight. Where 66,000 is about 65,000 Dalton, very close. And this is what is the information we get it from the AUC monomer and then dimer, the oligomer, and, and there are polymer species where you end up with uh, SC, the basically SCC will not be able to resolve all these. So it's having a column limitation uh, from a separation perspective. But AUC you will be able to see very nicely, uh, you know, so these are all the multiple uh, aggregates. So again, we'll have to see the sensitivity, uh, the basically method need to be ensured for its fits per purpose, sensitivity of the method, uh, to what extent it can detect some of these agglomerates or aggregates, specificity of the method, so some of the negative controls can be used like a stress sample, a pH chart example, to ensure that the method uh, demonstrates, uh, you know, uh, selectivity. So repeatability and reproducibility again on different days, how does it behave on different multiple people to have the sample. So these are basically need to be ensured in terms of reproducibility and repeatability. So that is all the content. So I would like, like to acknowledge my team. Uh, this is the team where we work on the website and some of the protein based products. Thank you. Thank you, Vin. Thank you. Excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you so much.